Hi, my name is Gaston Traver. I'm going to be presenting this talk with Martin Doyana. We are security researchers in Anapsis, in Anapsis company. Um, we are part of the security research team. We, we used to work looking for vulnerabilities in Oracle, in SIP products. We are, we used to contribute in some blog posts, in some online publications. We have made some trainings in some other conferences or, or, or present in some other conference too. So I don't know if you want to know a little more about what we do in Onapsis, you can visit Onapsis website. Um, this talk will be divided in six different parts. In the first one, we are, we will be talking about what an ERP is, what financial applications works. And then Martin will be presenting CCF vulnerability, the vulnerability he found. And Martin will be using that vulnerability to make a wire transfer. Okay. Then I will be presenting the EBS payment vulnerability I found. I'm going to use that vulnerability to make a check printing attack. Okay. And then we'll be, we will be presenting a conclusion of all this research. So what was the, the, what, what was we looking for when we start this research? When we, when we start this research, we were looking for profit, but a lot of profit. And the first thing we thought when we start uh, thinking about this, or the, the way we can get profit was, I don't know, rubber bank, um, governments, casinos, retail, juries, any institution or company or whatever that can handle a lot of money. But the problem with the, all of these targets is that you can end in jail or death. Okay. So those, those were not a really good ideas. So then when, when we continue thinking about this, we say, okay, well, what we don't just take one of those ERPs we used to um, research and try to go far. Okay. Because ERPs are responsible to handle a lot of money in companies. So we use, in general, we used to look for vulnerabilities there, but that's all. We don't use to go far and, and look how you can exploit that vulnerabilities and take profit for there, from there. So we start researching, basically thinking about that. But first, what the, what's an ERP? What, when we talk about an ERP, what we're talking about? Well, an ERP, what an ERP means, ERP means re enterprise resource planning. What, uh, what that means is basically an ERP is an application that a company uses to handle the resources. Okay. But when we talk about resources, okay, we are talking about employers, um, I don't know, clients, um, partners, uh, I don't know, um, products, right? But we are talking about money too. We are talking about financials of the company too. And when we talk about financials, we are talking about cash. Okay. So ERPs are responsible to manage cash in the, in, in big companies. And this is the interesting thing about ERPs. ERPs have special modules that, that are called, um, financial modules. Those financial modules are able to, for example, um, make wire transfers and make check generations or make prints of some checks are able to handle bank accounts and a lot of things. They are able to do that because they have to be able to pay a supplier, a vendor, um, manage pay the, uh, payload, uh, payment orders <coughs> and that stuff. So because the ERP have to do that, ERP have to be able, they, the financial model have to be able to make uh, that kind of bank operations. Okay. So that's the interesting part of all this on what we are looking for. <coughs> but one, what could one expect about those systems? Because are really critical if they are handling a thousand of millions of dollars of a company, they should be probably in a bunker inside, uh, um, behind a lot of walls, uh, under the ground, I don't know, in a, in a really restricted place. But this, that's not really true. They are restricted, but uh, in general, many of those systems are really exposed. If you, for example, make a request and um, make some queries looking for ear, ear, in, for ERP systems in Shodan, you will find that there is a lot of systems there. So ERP systems are not just um, 
systems that you can access. They are vulnerable and they are really, really uh, exposed to many of you, to, to any of you. Another interesting thing about ERPs is that the, the ERP systems that are in production are not always patched. Why? Because uh, it's really dangerous to patch a system, an ERP systems. ERP systems are systems that could be working for years. And when you have vulnerability patch, security patches, um, they, those patches doesn't, doesn't guarantee that the ERP will continue working um, after the patch will be applied. So, companies, it's not rare that companies prefer to leave the ERP working against to apply the security patches. So, that, that means that if you find an ERP, it's not rare that the ERP is vulnerable to all vulnerabilities that someone could be report, someone could report uh, one or two years ago, maybe. Okay. So they are exposed to you because they are, many of them are exposed to internet and they are vulnerable to. <clears throat> and it's not a misconfiguration that they appear in internet because many of them appear in internet because they need to be connected to other ERPs that exist, for example, in other countries. For example, if you have a company that, that exists in US and you have a one of that, that one another office of the same company that is in, in Europe and that company have to make some European requests to the other to the other, they have to be exposed to internet. Or those companies that have a lot of customers or I don't know, many many there are there are a, a, a many many situations where where ERPs have to be open, okay, to internet because they could receive connections from anywhere. So that is why it's not it's not a misconfiguration that that ERPs exist open like this. Okay, but what happened with with that open ERPs? Nobody hacked them. Nobody hacked them. Well, that's that's not true. Some of them were uh, have have been hacked. But the problem with that cases were that when hackers attack those systems and they gain access to those systems, they don't know what can do with those systems. And what they do, in general, they used to do the same that they do with any other common system. For example, mine cryptocurrencies, um, install ransomware, make that system part of a botnet, or make it as some kind of extortion. So, um, it's, it's pretty sure, I'm pretty sure that they don't know how much money those systems are handling. And probably they get, I don't know, thousand maybe, thousand of dollars, uh, mining Monero, but they don't know that probably that system is handling hundreds of, hundreds of millions of dollars. Okay. So, and, and here is where we are interesting, uh, interesting for. What we can do, well, the idea, <coughs> the idea of this research is to mix the security knowledge we have about uh, how to attack an ERP, how to gain, uh, gain uh, access to an ERP, and how can we go farther and make a, a far and make a, a post exploitation of that systems. So the idea is to make not just attack the system and gain and gain access, else try to make a post-exploitation and take a lot of profit of, of that system using what we know about ERPs. So, okay, Martin will be presenting you, Martin will continue and we, he will be presenting you what a, a little more, more details about Oracle EBS because it's, it's something we have to know. Hello everyone, my name is Martin Doyenar and as Gaston already introduced us, I'm not going to do it again. Instead, I'm going to start talking about Oracle EBS next week which is the ERP we chose for our research. So a quick introduction to EBS. It's Oracle's main ERP software. It's entirely written in Java Enterprise Edition using Java server pages, servlets, and applets. It runs on a WebLogic server, which is nothing more than a web application server for Java. For storage, it uses an Oracle database, which is a well-known relational database. And to fix vulnerabilities, Oracle releases every three months a critical patch update which is a collection of security patches for all Oracle products. And we chose CBS because it's one of the most used ERPs in the world, and also it contains all the financial applications and modules that we will be using in our post-exploitations. 
And before I show the vulnerabilities I found, I'm going to introduce you to the Thin Client Framework, which is the API in where the vulnerabilities are present. So as I said, the TCF, it's an API provided to developers to build server-based applications by reducing the amount of processing at client side. This is done by defining client side and client and server classes that are similar to remote method invocation because they will share the same skeleton and they must implement the TCF in the TCF interface called proxy, which provides some methods that can be called by a remote client. So in an example, we can see that the TCF client object will call the read sync method and the framework will actually execute it at the TCF server object, which is the twin, the twin class and returning the results back to the client. And all this communication goes to a, with a TCF communication protocol, which is encapsulated in HTTP using the TCF servlet as an entry point or as a port, like a network port. But before the client can use any of the TCF objects that we just mentioned, he must first establish a communication. And this is done by using a class called dispatcher. So the class, the, the client will first create a client dispatcher with the information about the server, like IP address and the URL path of the TCF servlet. And it will also, this client dispatcher will perform a handshake through HTTP to the TCF servlet. And if this handshake is successful, the server will, cre will create a server dispatcher that will be binded directly to the client dispatcher. So the dispatcher can be seen as a socket, but it also stores information like the database configuration and the TCF object that will, that will be used by the client. <coughs> so let's see how the handshake looks like. It's a post request, as I said, or everything goes encapsulated in HTTP. And it has the TCF servlet path, which is called APPS TCF server. It has a TCF session ID, which is an alphanumeric string that is chosen by the client and go through an, an header called TCF start. One important thing is that the EBS session cookie is also sent, which means that only authenticated users are allowed to access the TCF servlet. And finally, a hard-coded string, which is the handshake string that we found by reversing the EBS Java application. If the handshake is successful, the server will respond with a J session ID, which is a Java session cookie that will be used in following request and will be used to store the server dispatcher just created. The most important class in ThinkLine framework is the proxy interface. As I said, it's a Java interface that must be implemented at both client and servers. And it will be implementing three different methods. The get pure type method, which is the one that says which is the twin class. So for the client TCF client object, it will just say the name of the TCF server object. The read item method, which is used for initialization. And this is because the server, the server classes will be instantiated with reflection. So no constructor will be called. And by using the read item method, you can emulate the, the constructor. And finally, a read sync method, which is a general purpose method that can be used for processing any kind of information. As an example, when a client wants to create a new proxy, he will, he will just create the my client proxy, which is the class implementing the proxy. And the dispatcher, the client dispatcher will retrieve the name of the, of the twin class by using the get pure type method. This will be sent direct, directly to the server dispatcher. And the server dispatcher will create the my server proxy, which is the, the, the twin class of the my client proxy. And it, this will be stored as a, as a, an object inside the dispatcher. So next, whenever the client desires to execute a method from my client proxy, like read item or read sync, the client dispatcher will recognize this and will ask the server dispatcher to, ex to execute this method and return the results. So now I'm going to start playing the vulnerabilities I found in this framework 
But the, the first thing that is important to notice is that, as I said, only authenticated users are allowed to use this, uh, this framework. So it will be useful to find a way to bypass this authentication. Uh, as an attacker, we, we probably won't have an, an EVS session. If we send a, a handshake without the cookie, without the EVS cookie, the server will respond with an error saying that only the only authenticated users are allowed to use the TCF. And to bypass this, we had to look at the, at the source code in the Java application. This is a pseudo code um, of the handshake that will be helpful for understanding how to bypass it. First, whenever a, a handshake request is uh, received by the server, the, the TCF servlet will create a J session ID, which is a Java session that will be used for storage, actually for storing the, the server dispatcher that also will storing the, the TCF servlet objects, the TCF objects, sorry. Next, the TCF target header will be retrieved and a connection key will be, will be created using this, this string. Now, the important thing is that the TCF start header doesn't need to be present because if the, if the get header TCF start method returns null, it will be just used as if it were a, a empty string. So it's the same to send the TCF start header with an empty string that sending, don't sending it at all. Next, the read handshake method will be executed, which is just comparing the hard-coded string with uh, the one that's been sent by the client. And if this is successful, then the server will create a new dispatcher, which is the server dispatcher, with the IP address of the client. And this will be stored, as I said, at the JSON, at the, sorry, at the Java session ID. And finally, it will check that if the TCF start header contains the closed met the closed string or if the, if the user is not authenticated. If any of this happens, then the delete the session is deleted and an error response is sent back to the client, as we already saw. But what is really interesting is that, as I said, the TCF start header doesn't need to be present, and if it's not there, then the TCF start will be cons or it's TCF session ID will be considered as an empty string. But the problem is that when the, the TCF start header is compared with a, with a string close, and if the TCF start header was null, this will produce a, an exception because it's, we are calling a, an equal method with a null object. And when this happens, the, the server will not raise an exception and will not delete the session but it will continue because it's not being handled properly. So, as I said, if we send the handshake without the either the EBS cookie and the TCF start header, the Java exception is raised, but we're still receiving the, the successful uh, response with the J session ID cookie. So this means that we have been able to create a new dispatch, a server dispatcher, and we have a session, a TCF session that we can use to create TCF objects. Okay. So, as I said, the important class is proxy because this is the classes that we'll be using to, to execute methods in, in the server with the remote method invocation. And as we already have been able to bypass the authentication, now the attacker is able to create any of these classes and call any of the methods read item or read sync. So the, the idea was to look for the default classes that are already implementing proxy in the, in the Oracle eBusiness suite and look for interesting actions such as common execution, database manipulation or files manipulation, which would allow us to perform some, to look for vulnerabilities that uh, allow the attacker to take over the system. And we did find many interesting classes, but we are going to focus in a particular one, which is called server postmaster. So the server postmaster, of course, implements the proxy interface and the read sync method. And it's the, one of the fewest class, or maybe the only class, 
that actually receives an array of bytes and operates with it. So most of the other classes will receive integers or strings or any other type of classes, but not byte arrays. So it was interesting to look why, is, why this is happening. And after reversing and understanding how this, uh, this class works, we understood that actually the, an object is being serialized and then it's being compressed using a zip method and it's sent back to the, to the server and it's sent to the server. So when the server receives this byte array, it will decompress it and convert it into an object input stream. And this object input stream will then call the read object method to deserialize and obtain the new object, which in this case will be cast to a message class. By now we are able to deserialize any object we want. So the idea is to create a gadget, which is a chain of objects that when deserialized, end up executing any interesting actions we already mentioned. To do so, we will send a byte array to the server postmaster, which will be decompressed into an input stream. The input stream will then call the read object method to retrieve the object sent by the client. And if the client sends a message class object, then the server postmaster will be able to cast it and call the root message method. And before I continue, I will explain what are messages in the server postmaster. The idea is pretty simple. Messages are objects that contain two attributes. One is service ID, which is an opcode, and a body, which is an object implementing the request interface. The request interface contains just one attribute, which is the service name. And when deserialized, the request will create a, a service using the service name and reflection. And this service will contain different methods that can be accessed through server postmaster and through the ThinkLine framework. And the method that will be executed in the service will depend on the service ID, which is an opcode. So if I send the opcode equal to one, then it will create a request, which will create a service, which will execute the method one. This means that we can execute almost any method inside a service or inside a class implementing service. So we start looking for interesting methods, meaning interesting uh, actions inside those methods. And we found one, which is the static method respond from the single response service. And what makes interesting this, uh, this method is that uh, there is a concatenation, there is a SQL statement creation with a concatenation of the select statement and a variable called language. So if we could control the language variable, then we could exploit a SQL injection vulnerability, which is great. But the problem is that the, the signal response service does not allow to initialize this variable. This is actually obtained from a session configurator, which is a session context. Uh, and also, we didn't find any request that is associated with this service. So we weren't able to call this response method. So we start looking for different services that could call this request, this response method from the single response service. And we did find one, which is the FND message request and service. So when the message calls the root message method, it will deserialize the request of the body. And if the request is an FND message request, it will create by reflection an FND message service when it's deserialized. This FND message service can execute the method execute by sending the service ID equal to 10. And when the execute finish, it will call the respond method from the single response service. So by this, we are able to access this, uh, this vulnerable code and we might be able to exploit this vulnerability. But the problem is still we need to find a way to set this uh, language session and or this language from this session configurator. And so we start looking for different sessions, sorry, different services and requests that could be used to initialize this variable. And we did find one, which is the, which is the service called context bootstrap service, which is created through the context bootstrap request. And it's a service for initializing the context and any other configuration from the server postmaster. So by sending a context bootstrap request, we can create a context bootstrap service through reflection. 
and the Contact Bootstrap service will create a session using uh, creating the display language or setting the display language. If we send a session configuration option inside the Context Bootstrap request, it will be used to create this session. And so we will be able to set this display language using this session configuration object. And by doing this, we can inject a SQL statement that can be used to exploit the vulnerability we previously mentioned. So this is a second order SQL injection. First, we will inject the, the string or the, the code. And this is done by creating a bootstrap request, which will create a bootstrap service that will create a session. And this uh, session will be, will be created with a session configurator, which can contain the display language. And after, we will use the FND message request to create an FND message service that will call the respond method that will execute the SQL statement. And by using some, some well-known techniques <coughs> from the Oracle database, we can declare a, an autonomous transaction to execute any query we want. So as we saw, this language was concatenated with a, with a select statement, but by using the declare pragma autonomous transaction, we can execute any kind of query like an insertion or a deletion or anything that modifies a database table. So now we are going to see a demo of how we can exploit this to modify the, the password of the admin user. As I said, using these vulnerabilities, we are going to modify the sysadmin user password, which is the most privileged user in Oracle Business Week. And first, we are going to try to log in using the password hacking the box Singapore 2020. Of course, this login failed because this is not the password. So we will start by sending a handshake without the TCF star header. This will produce an exception, but it will not be handled correctly. So we will receive the J session ID cookie. And using this cookie, we will create the server postmaster object, which is the class that implements proxy. And now we are going to create the object that will be deserialized by the server that will cause the, the SQL injection. First, the object generator jar would ask us for the username and password, for the username, and then the new password that we want to set, and the file name that we will save these objects. And now, with a Python script, we are going to send these objects to the server so that they are they get deserialized, and we obtain we can change the password of the sysadmin user. The Python script asks us for the victim host, which is paydavs.com, the object file name that we just created, and the J session cookie that we obtained from the handshake. And now when we try to log in, we see that we successfully log in with the sysadmin user. Using these vulnerabilities, an authenticated attacker would be able to obtain full control of the Oracle eBusiness Suite applications as well as the Oracle EBS database. But the question now is, if phase 1 is hacking EBS and phase 3 is obtaining profit, then what is phase 2? Meaning, if an attacker is able to control an ERP, how can he make real profit out of it? And to understand this, we are going to present the ERP payment modules. These modules, which are present for example in Oracle eBusiness Suite, provide create, read, update and delete operations on vendors, invoices and payment orders, which organizations will use to pay to suppliers. They also store financial information such as the bank account data, the payment methods supported by the organization, and finally, configurations to make the payments effective. So the way they work is whenever an organization needs to pay to a supplier, he will first create this supplier in the, in the Oracle eBusiness Suite application by providing bank data, such as the bank account number and the bank name. Then an invoice will be created for this supplier, which will contain information about how much money is going to be paid to this supplier and why this money is going to be paid for. Next, a payment order will be created for this invoice, which will tell how this money is going to be sent to the supplier, 
So, for example, the payment method can be an electronic phone transfer. And finally, a payment document will be created from this payment order that will actually move the money from the organization to the supplier. So, in most companies, there is a payment day every once in a week or once in a month. So, when this day comes, uh, the, the responsible person will pay, will create a payment request a payment close request to the EBS server and the EBS server will generate an EFT file with all the information about the transaction that must be performed by the bank to send the money from the organization to the different suppliers. The EBS server will then send this EFT file through a payment transmission protocol or by or using any batch process to the bank and the bank will make effective all the payments by moving the money from the bank account of the of the organization of the company to the different suppliers and vendors. This is how an EFT file looks like. It contains a lot of data, but we only care about some of the fields. First, we can see that there is a payment amount. The last two digits are just for cents, so in this case, it will be sending $1,086 to the bank account number that is described at the right and the destination bank account name and finally we have the branch name of the destination account that can be obtained just by calling the bank and asking which is the, the number of the branch. So after seeing this file we need to have we need to know how to modify this file in order to create a, a new file that, that can be used by the bank to send money to whenever to wherever the attacker desires. So again, if phase one was hacking EBS and phase three was obtaining profit, then phase two is of course modifying the payment data in the database. Again, using the vulnerabilities we already described, the attacker can send a TCF payload to the EBS database and modify all the information about payments, about invoices, and about suppliers. Now, when the payment day comes, the responsible person in the company will send the payment close request to the EBS server. And the EBS server will generate the EFT file, but instead of using the real information of the, of the suppliers and the payment orders, it will use the information that the attacker has uh, injected in the, in the database. So now, the attacker is able to control the EFT file and whenever when the EFT file is sent to the bank, this bank will, set, will make all the transactions that the attacker wants so he can send any money from the company to his bank account. So we are going to use a Python script to exploit the vulnerabilities we already found and by doing so, we are going to modify the payment orders that had already been approved so that when the EFT file is generated in the payday, the attacker can control all the transfers that are being performed by the bank. So the <coughs> exploit is called EFT exploit and as argument it expects the, EFT, the EBS target. So in this case it's payday EBS. And it will first verify the target is vulnerable. And if so, it will offer us to modify the, the information from these payments. So first, it will retrieve all the payment orders that had already been approved. And remember, these payments that we are going to see had been approved by many actors in the organization. So when the, pay, the payment day arrives, nobody will double check them because they are considered to be all right. They, nobody should be able to modify them. We are going to modify the Hacking the Box Singapore vendor or the payment for this vendor. And so all the information from this payment will be retrieved and in the script will ask us if we want to modify it to obtain profit. We will say yes. And so it will ask us the new bank account number. Let's provide one. A new bank name, which is Attacker Bank. A new bank address. This is just for some, in some cases, the ERP will check if the bank address is, uh, corresponds with the bank name. And finally, a bank branch number, which in this case will be 111. 
Now, when we provide all this information and we enter, we enter <coughs> to presenters to start the exploit, all this information will be modified in the payment order so that all the payment that's going to go to the Hacking the Box Singapore vendor will actually go to our account. So in this case, it will be $213,800. Finally, it will ask us if we want to erase all the logs from the audit tables. And of course, we will say yes. This is because we have the, when we exploit the vulnerabilities in the Think Client framework, we are actually exploiting them with the APPS user, which is a really highly privileged user in the database. And finally, it will ask us if we want to create a trigger in the database so that when the payday arrives and the, and the EFT file is generated, all the information from this payment uh, is changed again to the original one so that no one can know what happens. If we create this trigger and the attack has been successfully completed. So we created a batch process in the EBS server that will move all the EFT files from the, from the EBS server to the bank server. The bank server has a FTP server which uh, holds all these EFT files. So let's log into it. We will be logging using the EBS user. And let's look for the EFT files. We see that there is just one. Let's retrieve it. And let's look at the EFT file that was generated and sent to the bank. And as we can see, the payment for hacking the box Singapore now has the bank account that we provided, which is 01234567899, still the same amount of money. It's going to be sent to the attacker bank, which is at 007 Payday Street. And the bank, the bank branch number is 111 as we provided. So this means that when the EFT file gets to the bank, all this money is going to be sent to the attacker account and nobody will ever know how this ever happens. Okay, so let's talk about an eBusiness Suite payment module. The eBusiness Suite payment module basically is a module responsible to make the interaction, make the interaction between the EBS and the banks, okay? For that, this module handle a lot of handle many protocols like FTP, HTTP, AS2, that is a proprietary protocol, and this module is responsible for handle requests from provider, customers, and that stuff. All that from using HTTP for, for that, okay? And for, for example, when a provider wants to make, a, or a customer wants to make a payment to the company, he make a request, okay? And this model, module is responsible to, to take that request and make a transaction with the bank. The fact that this vulnerability we will be talking about exists in the payment model doesn't mean we have extra credit for uh, the impact, okay? We don't have extra impact. Uh, because the vulnerability is in the payment module. It's just coincidence that we were, well, that we are talking about, uh, how to attack the pay, the financial uh, system and the vulnerability exists in the payment module. That, that doesn't mean that if the vulnerability was, I don't know, in a human resources model, uh, that vulnerability doesn't, uh, doesn't work for this. It, it could be the same. So. How, how, how we interact, how can we do or what an uh, user of this module interact with the, with this module? The, the first and easy way to do that is make a request, an HTTP request to that model. Those HTTP requests have a really simple format. The, those requests have to be a post request to the resource you are looking there, the, uh, IVA transmit uh, server, okay? 
there you have the post request dividing three different parts. In the first part, the blue one, you have two headers we are interested on. The first, in the first one, the first one, uh, OAPF, Dell, and LAM, this crazy name for a header, that, that, that header will contain the land of the green part of the request. And the second header will contain content land, that is the content land, the traditional one, that, keep, that will contain the full land of the, of the, of the post request, okay? What the green part of the request mean and what the orange one part means. The green part of the, of the request will contain an XML file that is modeling a method called inside a call, a, a class we, we will specify and the parameters we want to call. Okay. I, I will be there. I, I will be back over this later. So don't worry. So, but, but basically we have a call function inside the server. We are, we have to model using that, uh, that XML. It's like soap for those guys that know what soap is. It's like soap. Okay. You, you, you are modeling, a, a, a call, a call to a method. A call to a method of a class. And the orange part of the request will contain an extra payload that we will send, that we will be sending to the, uh, to this method we are calling. So let's analyze the XML we are sending. The XML that we are sending have to have that, this form. Okay. We have three different parts we are interested on. The first one is is that the, the two ones, the, the first two ones, the, the blue ones, are the code package, that is the name of the class we are interested on, and the second one is the entry point, that is the method we will be invoking of that previous class. In this case, it's like we are calling method to call of the class to use, okay? The third tag we are interested on are parameters. Parameters, you can, there you can found a lot of them that depend the, the method you are calling. And basically you have the parameter name and the parameter value that are, that are the parameters you are trying to pass to the method. But it's not that you pass them like uh, the traditional way, okay? Because this, if you, you don't have a remote command execution, um, code execution <coughs> in uh, here because what the, the server is doing is call the method you are trying, you are invoking, but using the parameters, passing the parameters as a dictionary, okay? And the input stream of the, that is the second parameter you will be sending to that method will contain the green part that we, that we have, what, that we have sent, um, with the request. You remember the green, the orange part, sorry, the orange part of the request. So. We will be basically with that, with that XML, we will be executing the method to execute method of the class, class to execute and passing as the first parameter a dictionary containing all the parameters we have listed um, in the different lines of with the tag parameter, key and value. And in the input stream, the input stream will be referencing all the orange part of the post request. Okay. So, what classes we could use here to, to make, um, transactions, to make, to, to, to make those, those invocations? The interesting one, or the interesting, uh, the, the class we will be looking for is file dump function. Okay. This class is responsible to dump files inside the EBS system. For this one, I will be calling the transmit method that is responsible to transmit the file to the EBS server. <coughs> the parameters I have to pass to that transmit uh, method in the dictionary are file dir, file name, and transmit ref. The file dir is the absolute path we will be using, uh, we, will, we will be working on. The file name is the file name of the file we will be using and, and where we will be writing the content of the extra payload and transmit ref is the relative path relative to the file dir path that we will be using. So the full path where we will be writing the server, we will be writing <coughs> the file in the EBS server 
is composed like in the bottom of the slide, like file dir plus the um, transmit reference plus the file name, okay? So what I did to exploit this basically was <coughs> make um make the use the class for class I use file dump, it's the same method was transmit, that's okay. And for parameters I use for file dir, I use the root file system, okay? For file name, I don't care, I don't want, I just put an empty string. And for transmit reference, I put the full other, the, the full path of the file I want to write, but without the um, slash of the root file system. And that's all. You There you have a, you can write files inside the EBS system anywhere, uh, even and even you don't need to make a pass transversal or, or similar. It's just, there you have a vulnerability. You have all you need to write files inside the, the ABS um, systems. So you can see how simple could be some vulnerabilities there. Okay, so uh, we are able to write files in EBS, but we, we need common execution there. So what we can do? What could we convert this in uh, in a common execution? The first thing you can do or you can try to do is create a web shell, okay? Write a file, write a file someplace. But um but you it's it's not really easy uh, to write files in um in in, in, in EBS or in, in other ERPs because they used to compile them the all the resources when they start they used to compile the resources and present all the resources already compiled. So when you try to, to when, when you modify one of those resources, you have to restart the systems to make that change reflect into the website. Okay, so that is not a really good option. What I found is a CGA file in EBS that I don't know. I'm I'm not pretty sure what that that Perl script do. That is there. I don't know. That doesn't doesn't matter. But when you write it, when you overwrite it. You, the, the changes are reflected in the in the website. So I decide to use that Perl script to write my my web shell. So the problem was that the, it was a long time until the, the last time I, I wrote something in Perl. So I had to 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 custom my archaeologic uh, custom, and I have to dress my my archaeologic cust custom and. And start writing some Perl web shells. So, with that web shell in Perl ready and working, I was able to make a post request to um, to make the to to upload it and, and overwrite this Perl script, right? And well, I the, the request the request I, I had to do was basically like like this like that a post request to the to the IB transmit a resource with the um, OAP headers and, and that stuff. And XML, the green part of your request, and XML referencing the, um, the, the, the class we were, work, we were talking about, but this time referencing this Perl script, okay? The referencing this Perl script, the absolute path of this Perl script. And in the orange part of the request, I append my my Perl script, right? And just make this request. With that, with that request, with that authentication, I upload a web shell that I can request and I can execute just making the request at the right side of the slide. Just make a, a request to that Perl script with the CMD uh, parameter and the ID command and execute the, the ID command. So let's make a, let's look the, the demo to 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 show you how how this works. Okay, so now we are here with DBS. We want to upload the the web shell, the Perl web shell. This is the script we want to override. Okay, there is a, a common error. This is the login we want to. We are, we are not gonna use, but this is the same script. We are going to use verb because it's easy to make this attack. And here is the attack we want to do. As you see, here is the class. This is the class we, we want to, we want to call. This is the method of the class. 
the values, and here is the full path without the, the root path at the beginning, the full path of the file we want to overwrite. And at the end of the, um, of the, of the body of the request, we have the web, the web shell script we want to send. So we execute, execute the, um, the request. You see, we have no session tokens or nothing that uh, mean an authentication. We have no authentication there. So if we go back to the script, the Perl script, and we run it back, run, run it again, we will see no error. If we try to execute a command like ls, we will see the name of the, of the script there. The script, the result is in the headers because WebLogic is appending more, more headers um, after the, the script execution. And if we run, for example, id, we will get the, the ID of the um, Oracle EBS user, okay? So, so we have the web shell really already working, and now we are going to explain how the check printing attack works. The check, the check system is really simple, and EBS to compose checks use two steps. In the first one, EBS take a template that will, that will be used to compose the check using the database information, and then in the second step, you EBS already have a file that will be comp with the, 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 the check file that will be sent to a printed queue. And that's all. In general, EBS don't use, it's, it's a really simple process as you see. And, and it's really common that EBS don't have the printer installed in the same place as the, where, where the system of uh, the, the EBS system is. Okay. For example, you can have an EBS in US and a printer in, I don't know, in China, for example. It's really common that. So what we need to um, to, to print a check, right? First, we need the, the template, the, the template of the check we want to print. For this, it's more useful or for it's more easy for us to take an already existing check in the system. In EBS, there is a cache for, for the already um, generated checks where we are going to use to take a, an already complete check and modify it. This is because complete a check is not a really easy process. There, are, there is some information which we maybe we have to take from the, from the database, and that's not easy. In the second step, we have to recognize the, the printer we have to use for checks. And this is not a problem too, because in general, EBS, the printers that will be used for checks, for checks printing, um, have a really, a really common name containing like something like, I, I don't know, a check printing or something similar because our really specified, our really, um, um, our printers that are, are used just for that. So, uh, that's not a problem too. So we have the, the two things, uh, we need to print a check. Uh, an already completed check looks like this. As you see, it's a really, really simple format. It's a, just text format. You have all the information the check needs, but the problem in general is the layout. We need to respect that, that layout to make up a, a correct printing, okay, and, and print a valid check. And that is what we are interested on. This is a, a real example of, of that. So let's, um, let's make the, the demo, okay? Okay. So we already have a web shell running in the in, in EBS. And what we want to do now is the post exploitation. We want to recognize a file, recognize a check file, download it, modify it, upload it, and make and send it to the printing queue. So let's do I'm I I upload a, a really simple script to receive connections for my desktop because it's easy to execute commands this way and not um, using the web shell. The web shell is like a, a really hard to use. So let's cut to the um, payday server, EBS server. Sorry, let's cut paydayebs.com, port 133. So, okay, if I check, I am in. The, there is a lot of files because uh, this is uh, we are working in the um, uh, reports directory that have a lot of files, not just checks. So the first thing we have to do is recognize 
uh, one already generated check. I, I already did it because it could take uh, too much time. So I, uh, I rename it to check that out. Another thing that I, I am doing is using a plain text check. This is not the common, this is not the common format. The, the common format used to be PDF or RTF that are the, the, the BS formats that EBS used to use. But because this is the most easy to edit file, kind of file, I choose this one. So to export this file, I'm going to use a base64 command and the name of the file. I'm using this. Some of you maybe, maybe are, maybe are asking the questions. Why I don't just edit it in the, in the server, right? Why I don't just use BI and edit it? But they, uh, well, that's because I want to respect the, respect the, um, the full process. If, if, in this case, I'm editing a, a text file, but if I have to edit a PDF file, file, probably I have to download it and edit it with a more complex tool and then upload it back. So I want to, to respect that process. So base, uh, base 64 to decode it. And I'm gonna redirect the output to, um, test that out. This is the output. Control D. So here we have two files. The other file, Gaston.out, is the same file that test. If we check test.out, we're gonna see that is the file that we have in the EBS, the check file. If we use the same with Gaston, Gaston.out, we're gonna see that it's the same file but modified using my information. So Gaston is the file we are going to upload now. Um, Gaston.out. And I'm gonna dump this file to the EBS server using the same command I used uh, before. Dump to set 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 that out. And control B, control D. Control. Okay. Here I disconnect because then my 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 shell implementation. Yes.com, but that, it, that is not a problem. Okay, we are back. So we have the the already modified file. So the only thing we have to do now is send it to the printing queue. And to do this, we just have to do LP and the name file that we want to print. That is the check. Okay. After, uh, before I do that, I'm going to say that in this EBS server, we have just one printing queue configured. That is a Linux machine I have in the next room. This EBS is in, is in, uh, in Amazon. So basically, when I run the command, this, I, uh, this printing process will start from Amazon, but will end in my next room. In the next room, you will see in the, in the square, in the other square of the, um, of the, the slides that there is a printer, um, and, and you will see the check going out from there. So let's start. Let, I'm gonna start the command. And I'm, I'm go to, I will go to the, to the next room to continue the presentation there. I don't see if you. There you have, that's the result. That's a real check. So conclusions. We have four conclusions for this talk. In the first one, companies fully trust in their ERPs. If companies don't, don't really trust in ERPs and don't, they don't ask questions about if the information that ERP is generating is true or false or if it really is real or not, okay? In the second, in second, when critical software is compromised, functional controls are useless. This is because, well, you are controlling all the system and functional controls will not do a lot. And all software with new vulnerabilities, the serialization everywhere. This is true because, well, ERPs in general are really old software. They have 
really common vulnerabilities, but the new ones are really hard, okay? New kind of vulnerabilities that the serializations are a problem in these systems because there are those are things that they were not thinking about when they developed those systems, so are really critical in general when, when you found some of that kind of vulnerability. At the end, if hackers improve their post-exploitation, the end is near. And that's true because um, until today, hackers don't know how to make a post-exploitation of the systems. And that is good for companies, but how much more time will pass until they start learning how to make a really good post-exploitation of those systems. So thanks, Guy. Um, there you have our emails. Any questions you have uh, for us, you can write us. And thanks to look for uh, look this talk. Bye.